<laughs> All right, so welcome to Night Hacking at the Ordev Conference. I'm here with Jimmy, and we're going to talk a little bit about your book about the um, Commodore 64 generation here in Sweden. So exactly. tell me a little bit about your inspiration for the book. Um, as I said, I work a lot with high-tech uh, companies, a lot with entrepreneurs within the high-tech industry, and it turns out that a lot of them had shared the same um, uh, Commodore 64 background as I did, and uh, I find that funny that nobody ever told that tale about how the Commodore 64 shaped so many of our great programmers and great startups, so that's the tale I wanted to tell. Cool. So I, I grew up with a VIC-20. Do I count? Sure do. <laughs> yep, that's a predecessor of the Commodore 64, a great computer also. I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I remember retyping in extremely the wrong basic programs because it didn't have any, um, any storage system. Right. Well, neither does the Commodore 64. But the great thing also about the VIC-20 is that it has this prompt, this blinking cursor already when you turn it on. It turns yeah. on, it boots in a second. Yeah, and it, it just says, ready, please, please program me. Uh, no, no computer does that anymore. And I think that's one of the secrets to why it became so popular with code. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Actually, if you look at a lot of the modern devices, which people get, um, tablets, cell phones, all sorts of things, they're, not only are they difficult to program, but they are not devices you can write programs on themselves. Right, And they have prohibitive sandboxing models, which make it extremely hard for you to hack them and exactly. code and develop your own stuff. So I think, if anything, we've actually taken a huge step back as an industry for encouraging people to actually program and write little applications of things for the devices they own and play with. Right. I see I don't have to convince you here. <laughs> 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 so tell me a little bit more about um, kind of the, the beginnings of this book and um, how, how the Commodore 64 shaped the, the culture here. Well, uh, first thing I, I realized was that Sweden is a pretty famous, at least we like to think so, gaming nation today. Not only IT, but also gaming in particular. And it wasn't like that in the 80s. And that's weird because we had so many computers, so many um, youngsters who like to code, but it turned out we didn't have enough business experience to actually do something about it. What we were good at, though, was cracking these games, cracking software titles in general, and, like you said, hack the computer to do th stuff that it's not supposed to do. Okay, so lots of like individuals or folks going off and doing really creative things, but just not monetizing on it. Exactly, because there was no way of doing that. Working with IT in the 80s was more administrative things, uh, like doing old boring programs on the PC, which was not, by the way, a very um, colorful and, and funny platform at the time. Some people still don't think it is, but it, it was really just monochrome screens and uh, no fun at all. So how does that changed over the decades here in Sweden? It's changed because these people, uh, they went together, they formed groups who competed against each other, not only in, in, in hacking and cracking, but also in, in creating demos, they were called. Um, yeah, no, the demo scene was extremely popular yeah. for a while. Yeah, no, it still is. That's the funny thing. Uh, at the end of the book, I, I, I realized that it's still vibrant. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I was at the demo party in Holland a couple of weeks nice. ago. There were 300 people. It's the largest wow. Commodore 64 demo party in the world, 50 Swedes. And they're still doing wonders. Nice. Same people, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so every year they get a little bit older, the, the generation which is doing the demo parties? Yeah, they did. But something happened in 2009, 2010. It actually starts to grow now. And there are even people who were not born, or at least very, very small, very, very young. When, when the, the Commodore 64 yep. came out, who were so actually entering the demo scene. It's growing to some extent. Absolutely. Cool. So um, what, what else have you learned through writing the book about um, the culture here, the professional culture? Well, the thing is, it's, it, it, this book does not contain only programmers. It also contains um, culture workers, uh, graphic makers, and musicians, and, and other uh, roles in society like that. And even though they maybe did not program the computer, they got a lot of inspiration from things like games and the whole... Uh, aesthetic around uh, computers. So it's not 
only developers in that book. Of course, the main part is about developers, but it's cool also how opera singers, authors, um, movie um, makers, how, how different, uh, different people um, go forward and tell about their experience, how their careers also changed because of this home computer. Did you have to do a lot of research for the book, like um, interviewing different folks and uh, yeah. finding different people who had their lives impacted through the computer technology? Oh, definitely. The whole book is, uh, is a coffee table book with 30 people that I've interviewed. And of course, I have interviewed like three times more just, just to get those stories. And sadly enough, it doesn't say in your forehead, I use the Commodore 64. So it has been a real hard work to find those people <laughs> Not only ones I know, but also people that out, outside of my own uh, comfort zone. Yeah, no, definitely. If you're, if you're trying to get people who from a range of different disciplines, then you have to do a lot of legwork to, to find folks yep. um, who have an interesting story to tell. So what, what's one of your favorite stories from the book? One of my favorite stories is about, uh, of course, these people are all Swedish. So they're, not, they're not that famous outside of Sweden, but this is a pretty famous um, opera singer. His name is Richard Soderberg. And um, the funny thing about his story is that he compares a game, like a platform game, like Ghosts and Goblins or something, to the opera or a theater scene, where he can see that, okay, this scene here, pretend this is an opera scene, they can change environment in just a matter of seconds. They can make it like rain, they can make it windy, they can make it mountains and whatever. And he felt every time he was on stage that he was actually in a computer game. Well, some, some some, in some way. Uh, and that was a funny description because that, that's not what you expect from a, a serious professional opera singer. I didn't. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. I mean, I think a lot of folks who are in the performing arts kind of have to um, create a persona that they use for, for doing their performance. But getting the inspiration from video games is, is um, very unique. <laughs> It's very new. I think that will be much more uh, common in the future because video games are, you know, in every aspect of society today. So I think that will be as huge as getting inspired by books or movies or whatever, definitely. So one of the big themes of the conference here is Man and Machine, and they have um, retro video games all throughout the, the exhibition hall yeah, here. Yeah. So does this, um, have you seen any comedy, Commodore 64s out there? No, I have not. Um, okay, we gotta we gotta talk to the conference organizers. <laughs> well, it I've takes a while. When you start up a flipper game and when you start up an arcade game, they 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 uh, they boot up instantly. And sure, the Commodore 64 boots up instantly, but the game does not load instantly. Yeah. So uh, the opposite. You know that from the Vic 20, 20 also. Now, well, so after my Vic 20, I <laughs> my next main computer was I got it on old. Mac 512K enhanced. All right. And I would have to say that the boot time of that was atrocious. And since it had no protected memory, I could crash it very easily. So a lot of my programming experiments took, you know, hours to get it right because I'd keep crashing and restarting and crashing and restarting and losing code and retyping in. It was wonderful. That's how you toughen up <laughs> as a programmer. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, it's it's... I would say that's true to extent because one of the things I learned from that is that code is cheap yeah, and it's the thought process which goes into coding that's important. And I, I made that realization after I worked on a project for about two months. Okay. My hard drive crashed. I started over from scratch and it took me like, I don't know, two or three days to get back to the same point. All right. So it was the experience of having done it the first time, which made the second version that much better. But uh, yeah, but, but most it, developers nowadays with version control and SSDs and all the modern technology, you're, you're never going to lose all your code. You'll never have that experience of throwing away part of your life. <laughs> and you think that is a, a loss? I, I think it's uh, toughening up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. No, yeah, but. The, the important thing about this book and doing books like this about the retro scene is that I usually say things were not better before. Things were different before. That's very, um, it's, it's, it's important, I think, to, re to remember. I talk about Sweden in 19 and 1983, 
And it may sound like I'm mocking uh, the people back in, uh, 30 years ago, but I'm really not. It's just that it's, it sounds funny when you compare things how, how they used to be to, uh, with, with today's society. But it's nothing to laugh about because people in 30 years will laugh about us sitting here and talking about our, our, our stuff. It's just important to realize what was the same and what is different. You're talking about things that are not the same anymore. Maybe that's not important because there are other things that, that, um, that they have instead, other challenges, other, other uh, yeah, problems. Okay. So speaking of things which have changed, is there anything you learned about through writing the book where you could point out and say, well, this is something which we've actually taken a step backwards in how it works, where it was actually better with the older generation of computers and somehow we've lost some of that in our modern incarnation. You mean other than the boot up sequence? Uh, <laughs> no, I can say one thing for sure. One thing that has not changed that much is how parents look at uh, their kids programming or gaming um, activities. They were worried then, 30 years ago, about you're wasting your life, why are you sitting there, why are you not out running and playing soccer? It's exactly the same thing we hear today. It's just that we are the parents. That I'm surprised that it hasn't changed. Are you one of those parents? Uh, my, my kid is just four <laughs> year old, so, so not yet, but maybe I will be. It's just that we apply our way of how we grew up onto kids that grow up today. That's yeah, not no, right. That's, that's, that's horrifically true. Yep. We will not understand, and we, I think we have to accept that. We, 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 of course, we should try to understand, but we have to accept that we won't. I think that's important. I'm not a cycle, I mean, you know, I'm not trained in this, but, but I can see totally that we're doing exactly the same thing as our parents did. Why are you sitting there? Now, well, so being, well, a lot technology professionals, you know, a lot of us are coders for our day job. Um, I think probably we're more inclined to, to give freedoms to our children to do more computer stuff. But at the same time, I've, as a parent myself, I've noticed there's a large amount of peer pressure in the schools and the other parents to put a lot of artificial restrictions on your, on your children's use of technology. Yep. And I'm not sure... I mean... I'm just a parent. I'm not sure that giving your child a lot of computers and a lot of programming um, references is the right way to go either because to, to some extent, the reason why these kids were so into this thing was exactly because their parents didn't like it. You know, it's a kind of, you know, a teenage revolution going on. So if you just give your kid everything, they might, you know, they might refuse to do it just because you as a dad, give it to them. Okay, so the right technique is <laughs> you, you tell them no, no, don't get off that computer, and then you look the other way while they're playing. Here is a computer, here's a game. Please don't, please don't break that game's copy protection. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I just see that it, part of it was not because the computers were there. Part of it was that it was forbidden. Yeah, no, that's the fun part. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, that we can remember. So, so you can't choose, I guess, the way that your kids are going to revolt against you. But, you know, you can at least understand that they will do it at some time, at some point. All right. So now that we're, we're chatting about, you know, something completely off topic. Yeah. We've gone to kids and technology. Yeah. I'll, I'll continue the tangent. All right. <laughs> so one of the things which I've been, I've been helping out with is um, technology workshops for kids. Yep. So do you think we're corrupting future generations of children by exposing them to technology at a really early age, or is that a good thing to do? Ooh, I'm talking without any scientific experience here, but I think it's good. Uh, technology is part of our society today, and of course, what you need to do, you need to take care of your body, you need to take care of everything. I mean, you have to move, you have to eat correctly, you have to do all those stuff that make you a healthy person. But other than that, I think technology is, is great, of course. You wouldn't want to do it the other way around, uh, having them you know, be less uh, used to technology than any other uh, kids. So I'm, 
I'm pro technology, definitely. Okay. Pro, uh, pro kids technology. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. So I think this has been very enlightening, learning a little bit about the, the history of computer technology here in Sweden and, you know, going on wonderful tangents about opera singers and kids and all sorts of stuff. And I am, I am very much looking forward to when the, when the book gets translated to English. <laughs> I hope that will be done very soon. Next yes. year, maybe. Yeah. So where can folks find out more information about your, your book or yourself? Well, there's a web page, generation64.se or .com, and it's everywhere in online bookstores in Sweden and uh, also in most uh, uh, bookstores, actually. So it's not hard to find. Cool. Yep. All right. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it.